In this video, we're going to come up with a formula and a technique for calculating the surface area of a sod of revolution. So suppose I have a curve that represents a function across some bounds, so starting from x equals a to x equals b. And I generate a sod by rotating that curve around either the x-axis or the y-axis. So here I have rotated about the x-axis, and I'd like to calculate the area of the surface of that solid that I've generated. Well, we go through the same thing that we've done when we calculated volumes or areas of, of other figures, is we start by breaking up our interval from A to B into several smaller subintervals. And so here I just have four of them. But we know we want to use a large number so that really I just have a bunch of thin slices of this solid. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate the function on each of these slices just by the secant line here. And then I'm going to calculate the surface area of each of these little slices. And by the surface area, I'm just talking about the outside, the lateral surface area. So let's just look at one of these slices. Now, if you look at this, this is, if I generate this, I'm sorry, if I generate this solid by just taking this region under the secant line and rotating about the x-axis, it's not a cylinder, but it's actually a portion of a cone. It's, you can think of it as the base of a cone. It's called the frustrum of a cone. So you have this larger cone, and you chop off the top, and what's left over is called the frustrum. So let's see if we can do some geometry and figure out a formula that will help us calculate the surface area of this frustrum of a cone. Because once I know that surface area, then I can get an approximation by adding up the surface area of all of these slices. And then we'll let the number of slices go to infinity in order to obtain an integral. So let's see if we can find a formula for the lateral area of a frustrum of a cone. So let's start. Here's an actual picture of a physical model that I made to at least figure out what is the lateral surface area of the entire cone. We'll start with that. So just to emphasize, lateral area just means along the sloping side. There is no, we're not calculating any area for the base of this cone. So if I have a cone, its lateral length is L. And the base has radius lowercase r. We can figure out the area by first slicing open the cone and flattening it out. When I do that, I get a sector of a circle. The central angle is theta. The radius of this circle, remember that comes from flattening out the cone here, is the same lateral length L. Now the circumference of the original base, the base, of the cone, after I flatten it out, that becomes the length of this uh, sector right here, along this portion of the circumference of this flattened out circle. So I should be able to write a relationship between the original circumference and the length of this. Now, if a theta is in radians, this length of the sector is just pi times L. And we know that the circumference should be 2 pi R. 
And what that allows me to do is write theta in terms of L and R. Why is that important? Well, the area of this sector is the lateral area of the cone. So the area of the sector is just 1 half theta L squared. So now we can use uh, some algebra and replace theta with our expression 2 pi r over L. And that reduces to pi r L. So the lateral area of a cone can be calculated by simply pi r L. That's for the entire cone. What about the frustrum? Well, how do we get a frustrum? All we do is we take the original cone and remove a small cone from the top. So all we need to do is take the surface, lateral surface area of the big cone and subtract off the lateral surface area of the small cone. Now, we're going to make the slice so it's parallel to the base of the original cone. So we actually have two similar figures. And so I'm going to change my notation a little bit uh, to be consistent with the book. So now the lowercase l only represents the portion on the frustrum. And the whole cone has a lateral length of lowercase l plus lowercase l sub 1. So since I have similar figures, I can set up a ratio between the corresponding lengths. And I'll do some algebra with that, which I'm going to use in just a minute. If I go back to what I'm trying to calculate, the surface area of the frustrum, well, I just need to take pi times r times l for the big cone. So pi times the radius times the lateral length minus pi times the small radius times the small uh, lateral length. This is the distributive property. And now I'm going to replace this L1 and only this L1, and you'll see why, with this expression that we determined from the similar figures. So when I make that substitution, I can see right away that the R2 is going to divide out. And I can go ahead and use the distributive property just with this term here. And I see that my second term is pi R1 L1. And I'm subtracting off pi R1 L1. So those two terms add to make 0. And then what's left over only involves, well, uh, the L, meaning the lateral length of the frustrum of the cone. And then I also have both radius 1 and radius 2. So if I factor out the pi and the L, now what I'm going to do is something which seems a little bit strange, but it will make perfect sense in our context. I'm going to multiply and divide by 2. And so then in the middle here, I have the average of the two radiuses. And I'm just going to call that average r with no subscript, just plain old r. So the surface area of the frustum of a cone is 2 pi r l, where we understand that r means the average of the small radius and the large radius. So now we've got the formula for the area of a frustum of a cone. Let's go back to finding the surface area of a solid of revolution. So the surface area of my first slice here would just be 2 pi r1 l1. In this case, r1 means I'm going to take the average of the function values at the left endpoint and the right endpoint for my first subinterval. And then the 
L1 is the length of this secant line. And then I'll do the same thing with the remaining slices, which whose surface area is the surface area of a frustum of a cone. So every slice is a frustum of a cone. So I can get an expression for each one of the slices, all n slices. And then say the surface area is going to be approximately the sum of the area of the all n slices. And I can write that as a Riemann sum. So certainly what I have here is my uh, length of the secant line segment here. And then you may say to yourself, wait a minute. We said that the R value was the average of the function values. And here you are or the average of the function values at the endpoints. And here you're saying that you only have f of x sub i star. Well, there's two ways you can think about this. One is you could say that, um, uh, really, let me just go ahead and replace r sub n uh, or r sub i with some function value. And uh, that would be a good approximation. But I'm going to say we can formally use the intermediate value theorem and say that since our function, it must be continuous on these subintervals. And we know that um, the uh, midpoint here, so the, um, not the midpoint, the average value is, has got to be, um, an intermediate value between whichever one is larger, the uh, f of x sub i and f, sub f of x sub i minus 1, then we can find an x sub i star where the, uh, where I can choose that the, that the function value at that x sub i star where it actually equals the average of those two values. So afterwards, we let n go to infinity. And so I get this formula, where 2 pi is on the outside, the integral from a to b, f of x, ds. And ds, remember, is our differential for arc length, arc length. So the way it's written, um, we'd have to do some work. And, and it is true. But this is advantageous, as we're going to see that uh, if we write things in terms of ds, then we can get two different formulas, actually four different formulas, because we get a formula for when the area is rotated about the x-axis. If we had rotated that same region about the y-axis, the only difference is, is that now our radius value instead of being a y value is a an x value. And really this is the way to remember this is 2 pi rl. So 2 pi of course is 2 pi. The integrand is your r value and the ds represents the lateral length. So I, here we have two formulas. I said we could get four and the reason we can get four is because we can choose how we calculate ds. We can either make it a formula which ends in dx or the corresponding formula that ends in dy. And it may not, may not be clear which one to choose in every case, but in most cases, if you think about the information in the problem, you can make a decision which is going to make things much simpler. So let's look at a couple of examples. The first example, I'm just going to take this y squared parabola rotated at about the x axis. So I have to make a choice. Uh, do I want to use uh, a dx integral or a dy integral? 
Um, I'm going to use a dx integral just because I'm used to using dx. That might not be the best choice. Let's see what work I need to do. Well, certainly using a dx integral immediately uh, tells me that I need to do um, a little bit of work up here. Um, I need to find dy dx, which means I'm going to have to solve my original equation for the parabola in terms of y. So that's not hard algebra to do it that way. Then I need to calculate dy dx. So that's just using the power rule. And I'll do some algebra on that. Make it a little bit simpler. Write it as a radical expression where I have a radical in the denominator. All right, now let me put that into my ds formula. So ds by dx would be this uh, formula here, 1 plus quantity dy by dx squared. And I'll do some algebra there. I'm going to write that as a single fraction. Collect the like terms. I, factored, I had a common factor of 4 in the denominator. That is, this 4 multiplies into there, and then I collect the like terms. So that 4 winds up being part of this 4x plus 1. But I can factor out the 1 over 4 to get 1 over, half, 1 over 2 outside the radical. And I'm going to split that into two radicals. Why? Because I have to take y, which has this radical x minus 2 in the uh, denominator and multiply it over here. So I'm getting confused here. I apologize for what I just said. Y, the y I'm looking at is this 3 radical x minus 2 that gets multiplied by this ds expression. And so the radical x minus 2 can divide out. And I'm just left with 3 halves radical 4x plus 1 dx. So that's not too bad. Uh, I'm given my bounds on x go from 2 to 6. So at least that part is simple. And I can evaluate this integral by just making a u substitution. I'll go ahead and change my bounds as well into terms of u. And then I can integrate just using the power rule and evaluate that between my new bounds. Work out the algebra. I get 49 pi for the surface area of this parabolic dish. So that wasn't bad. Um, and so let's compare what I would do if I chose to use a dy integral. Well, using a dy integral certainly has some advantages because the original equation uh, is easy to solve for x. Just divide every term by 9. Uh, this y which is part of the formula, does not need to be changed. It's just going to remain y. And I guess the only thing that I will need to do is change these bounds on x into the corresponding bounds on y. Well, let's solve for x, and then go ahead and calculate dx dy. A pretty simple expression. Just 2 ninths y. So calculate ds, I'll have to take 1 plus dx dy quantity squared. Um, let me do some algebra inside the radical sign. Let me write it as a single fraction. And then since 81 is a perfect square, let me factor out 1 over 81. So I get 1 ninth radical 81 plus 4y squared 
dy for my ds expression. So I'm not doing any integration yet, but I do need to change these x bounds into y bounds. So when x equals 2, I go ahead and put 2 here. I'll get 18 equals y squared plus 18. So y is just going to be 0. And then if I put in x equals 6 and work that out, I'll find that, uh, well, I have 54 minus 18. That would give me 36. And radical 36 is 6. Now, one note, we can see that uh, x is not a function of y. x would be the entire parabola. But since I am going to rotate that around the x-axis, I only want to take 1 half. So I'm going to go ahead and take the upper half. That's why I chose y to be positive 6. So then here's y times my ds expression here. My original bounds going from y equals 0 to y equals 6. And so I need to make another u substitution here in order to evaluate this integral or to find the antiderivative. Now I'm going to change my y bounds into u bounds. And so now, again, I'll just need to use the power rule to find the antiderivative, work out all this arithmetic. And I get the same answer, 49 pi. So in my mind, this is a little bit simpler. In the end, we did have a more complicated u substitution, uh, but calculating the uh, dx dy was simpler. So let's look at another example. We're going to take the area of this curve, which is a parabola minus a log curve. And we're given bounds in terms of x between uh, x equals 1 and x equals 2. But we're rotating about the y-axis. So rotating about the y-axis means that my r value is going to be x. So the x is going to appear as the integrand in our formula. And here, I really don't have much of a choice. I can calculate dy dx fairly simple. That's a simple calculation. Uh, but uh, And I could calculate dx dy using implicit differentiation, but I couldn't get everything in terms of y. So uh, I must use a dx uh, integral to evaluate this. So not going to try to solve for x. That would be really hard if it's possible at all. But I don't need to. I'm going to use this expression for ds. And now calculate dy dx. So let me use the power rule, derivative of natural log of x is just 1 over x. I'll write that as a single fraction. And then I'm going to take 1 plus dy dx quantity squared. So I'll, I'll rewrite the 1 as 4x squared over 4x squared, because 4x squared is the denominator that I get when I square the dy dx term, and I use FOIL in the numerator. And now I collect like terms, and we see something happening like we saw with some of our arc length problems, that now, after I write this as a single fraction and collect like terms in the numerator, the numerator is a perfect square. It's x squared plus 1 in parentheses squared. So when I take the square root of that, the square, the top and the bottom are both perfect squares. So I get a much simpler integral to evaluate. And in fact, here, since I'm multiplying times x, remember when I have a dx integral, this x, which is part of the formula, just 
remains as x. It wouldn't make any sense to try to solve for y and put y values in there. We have a dx integral, so we want everything in terms of x. But that x is going to divide out with the x in the denominator. So now I only have the uh, a nice polynomial to integrate, find its antiderivative, and perform the evaluation, work out the arithmetic to get 10 pi over 30. So in many ways, because we have either an x or a y outside of this radical sign, uh, it's actually uh, many times easier to evaluate these integrals that come from surface area than the integrals that we get from arc lengths.